overflow of power we can actually have because of Christ.
You guys know that we've been brought near to God because He sits on the throne of grace, not a throne of condemnation and judgment, right? That's right. We've been brought near. He took us there. Jesus Christ Himself brought us to God the Father because of everything that He uh, gave up to do that for us. And so I'm so thankful that I understand it. And I'm very thankful of, of His grace. I'm just thankful for this new covenant that I get all of the you know, all the benefits of it. There's not one single thing that God is holding back from me because this new covenant is far superior than the old covenant. Now the old covenant didn't go away before I started making some of you mad, but it's been fulfilled through Christ and His life and His finished work. And so I say a lot of things up here every week that, uh, that the Lord has brought to my mind that maybe not everybody might understand. And I reference the flesh over and over because it's a very key aspect of understanding how we relate to God. And so you and I, have, like I said, we've been brought here because we have the salvation of Jesus Christ. We've agreed with God on what sin was doing, which was just bringing death into our life. The wages of sin is death. Sin doesn't have, you know, doesn't have any benefit for us whatsoever. And so we, we understood that, that that sin was causing problems, and we understood that Jesus was the only answer. Uh, to answer or to save us from those things. And so I reference this word flesh over and over and every week. And, and, my, and myself, I've misunderstood it in the past, and I think that maybe not everybody might understand what the flesh is. So I wanted to take today and look at some scripture and explain to you in depth what the flesh really is and what that means to a believer. Okay? Now, you and I were created with needs. That's how we were born. Now, we were born in Adam, so we've been separated from God since birth because of the sin that we were born into. But we have these needs, and our initial instinct, because of the sin that we were born into, it was our tendency to go and ask the world first to meet these needs for us. Okay? And we all need unconditional love, we need acceptance. We need purpose in life. We need a positive identity. We need to be uh, at peace with our Creator. We need some, uh, some contentment in our life. And uh, this flesh was given to us, and it kind of took control because of how we were born into this world, that separation that I've referenced several times. And it's taught us to go and learn by life experiences and learn how to manipulate people and relationships and maybe the school of hard knocks, whatever you want to say. It's taught us how to try to go and get some of those needs met. Okay? Now, nobody really you know, taught us you know, that that's not the way to do it until we kind of started to grow up, started to mature, and our mind started to grow and things like that. But lots of people seek all these things out in other people. They seek them in relationships, in jobs, things of pleasure, politics, acts of service. The list goes on and on. So we have these needs, and we need to see them get met. And our flesh kind of takes over and kind of helps us try to go find those needs. But let me tell you what the flesh is not before we get too far into it. Okay? The flesh, and I'm talking about for a believer, you and I, we're believers. We have agreed with God in this new covenant. The flesh is not our human body. Okay? God designed our body and it has a form and it has a function and it's good. And if we take care of it, it will take care of us back. And so this human body that God gave us is not bad. And so sometimes we reference the flesh, I reference the flesh, and we might kind of mix up the two and that's, that's not correct. So your human body it's not bad. God created this so that He can express His purpose and His love through you. We're going to talk about that down towards the end of our time here today. The human body is good, alright? So there's nothing to hate about it. There's nothing expressly bad about it. And so the flesh is not our identity. We are a new creation. We're righteous and holy. Because of the new covenant, because of the life and the finished work, Jesus Christ. Now sin used to control all of that, but it is not in control now. So, we all seek from the world first. 
Sometimes we seek fame, sometimes we seek money, possessions, popularity, you know, this, this list can just go on and on and on. Oh, and another thing too is uh, uh, your flesh is not a sin nature. That comes from a real bad uh, interpretation uh, in the NIV that was not ever correct. And so as a believer, you don't have a sin nature and a holy and righteous nature. It's impossible for the light to be in the same place as the darkness. Jesus is in your heart, and that's what's there, and there's no room for anything else. So we need to get out of the habit of saying sin nature. It's actually not even in the new updated versions of the NIV. One person that was really good at uh, understanding language went to Zonor Van and showed them the error of the mistake that was put in there. And so like from 2012 or something like that forward, those words aren't even in any translations of the Bible anymore because they never should have been there to begin with. So please extract those words, sin nature, out of your mind, take them out of your vocabulary, because you don't have that. It's impossible for you to have that, okay? So flesh does serve as an attempt for us to meet needs in any way that we can think of apart from God, okay? And we've talked about some of the ways that you can do that, but it's an attempt for us to get any of those needs met Apart from God. Now I think that was pretty easy for us to understand. I think that was something that we would probably all agree with. But once we start to look in the book of Romans, we're going to look here in the book of uh, Romans chapter 8 in just a second here. But if you read the book of Romans chapter 7, you're going to see that there is uh, a lot that Paul talks about going on right there. About uh, walking in the flesh and trying to get God to meet your needs by keeping the law. And Paul talks about over and over about how that is impossible for you to do. Okay? There's, uh, now, I've had a problem with this for a lot of my life. And I think it goes to some of the teaching that I was brought up under. Some of us will probably share some of those same experiences. If you ever sit under any preaching and teaching where uh, specific sins were gone over each week and it made you feel real bad about some of those specific sins, uh, now I think that they had a good goal in mind was to get you to quit sinning, but the method that they taught to do that was probably just backwards from what it needed to be. And so, but if there's any time you sat under any preaching and they were talking about a specific sin and you don't have a problem with that specific sin, you felt pretty good about yourself. Or I know that I did whenever I left out of the church building. I'm like, well, I don't have a problem with that one, but I would look around in the room and I would figure out by their facial expressions and body language who had problems with that one. And I was like, well, I'm better than them right off the bat. Right? And so this is, a, a, I don't know if it was intentional or not. I'm going to sure hope that it wasn't. But this mixture of Jesus and the law of trying to get something from God just does, doesn't work. And so we've been taught over the years, somehow or another, that if we are able to keep the law, then we can get God to meet some of our needs because we are gaining His approval by keeping this old covenant and saying we agree with the new covenant and thinking that God is going to meet our needs. And that, unfortunately, is repulsive to God. Because there's this underlying belief that in there somewhere that yeah, I believe that Jesus is my Savior, but I'm going to need to keep the law so I can keep God's approval all the time because maybe Jesus' work on the cross and His life that He lived while He was here, maybe it wasn't just enough for my sins. I don't think that any of us set out to say that, but that's how we go about it. That's, that's an insult to the Lord. That's an insult to this new covenant that we have that we get to live under. This mixture just doesn't work. Romans chapter 8, we're going to start verses 1, go down through 8. It's going to show us that. But I would encourage you to please go back and read chapter 7 before you get to this. Just for time's sake, we're not going to. They saw much you can't live in both. You can't be doing both. There is therefore now no condemnation of those who are in Christ Jesus. I've thrown this at y'all at least a dozen times this year. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. You understand that before the, the Spirit was given back to whenever it was behind the veil, before it was loosed into the world, you and I did not have the opportunity to live by the Spirit. 
The only thing that we had was the flesh. And the law was given so that sin might increase. And that sounds weird, that sounds funny, and then sometimes we have a hard time believing that. But the law was given so that we might be able to define what sin is. We didn't know what covetousness was until it was defined in the law. Okay? So without the law, there was not any sin. Without the law, the flesh didn't, didn't really know it was in control. That was just all that we had. There was no spirit to live by, so there was nothing to contrast with. Okay? For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now it's important that you understand that if you're walking by the flesh, your mind is going to be set on sin and death. Back whenever I was trying to live by the law, I was so ignorant of the law, I only thought there was the ten. I didn't know about the other 603. So I got pretty good at trying to live by the ten. But whenever I learned that there was 600 or something more other ones, I was like, man, that's, that's a lot. That's kind of overwhelming. And so the, you go down through there and you read all of those and you see real quick that man, it's impossible to keep those things. And the only thing that's on your mind is whenever you're going through your daily life is, man, I've messed up on that. I might not be able to decide what number it is, but you keep being reminded over and over and over that sin is in control. And the only thing that you're going to have to look forward to is more sin and more death. Verse 3. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. Pay attention to what that said right there. Sometimes we just blow through that. The law was weak through the flesh. You see, the law didn't have any ability to be able to bring about righteousness or any energy into your soul. The only thing that it could do was to show you what the regulation was and to show you where uh, the deficiency lies. So God did this by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, He condemned sin in the flesh. But we know that Jesus was sinless, but He came in the likeness of sin on our account, on our behalf. That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. There it is right there. If you're walking in the flesh, you're trying to keep the law. Last week we talked about sin consciousness. And that might sound like a, a kind of a, an arrogant way of thinking to some Christians or to some people if they don't know anybody. It's not arrogant at all. People that are not conscious of their sin are not paying attention to sin and I'll guarantee you they're sinning less than anybody else. I promise. That's just the way that it works. God designed us to work that way. We are living in the Spirit. We've moved away from the flesh. The requirements of the law, trying to keep all of those things, all of that has just faded away from our mind. God has extracted those things because His Spirit takes up that space. In it. He has put His living Spirit within us. We're no longer paying attention to the ways that we mess up, and we're not messing up there as much. Verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. See, the Spirit has the ability to put energy into your life and into your soul. The Spirit comes about with the help of the Holy Spirit, the, the Helper, the Comforter. Through all of this, we start to understand that we have some peace with God because those requirements have been met. 613 requirements, to be specific, have been met in your life, in your spirit, on your behalf. You cannot violate those things anymore. You're going to mess up, you're going to slip up, you're going to have bad days. But there is no condemnation for you. There is no conscious level for that in your mind, in your spirit, in your body. All of those things are gone. The only thing that you're concentrating on is now you have learned how to trust God to meet all of those needs in your life that you needed before. You're not manipulating anything anymore. You're not lying anymore. You're not worried about money. You're not worried about possessions. You're not worried about relationships. You know that you get all of those things are going to show up in your life because you're trusting God for them. Whenever you trust God for those things in life, they show up. I don't know how to explain it. And they don't show up all at the same time, but they show up on time. It's just the way that it works. 
So all of these things, all of these needs that we were born with, God wants you to trust Him with those things, and He wants you to praise Him whenever they show up. That's all He's looking for is this perfect relationship with you. Now, He did things 2,000 years ago so that we might be able to have this peace and contentment with God right now and every sent Jesus in His sinless life to come down and live for us. Verse 6, but to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Whenever we're trying to walk by this flesh, death and hostility towards God is all we're going to have. It's a stark contrast between a peace and God. You know, whenever I used to lay down, you know, I've told you this story several times, and I hope I never forget it. I remember laying down in my bed every night before I go to sleep and confessing all the sins that I've done that day. And I would even try to go back and see if I'd missed something the day before because I wanted to say them out loud because I thought it was unlocking something with God that He might forgive me. Because I didn't want to have a heart attack in my sleep and not wake up and I wake up in hell because I didn't say something. That takes away from the goodness of God for us to ever believe that because we don't say something or that we forget about something that He might condemn us forever. That's not His nature. And so whether we understand it or not, whether or not we're conscious to it or not, whenever we are trying to walk by the flesh and we're trying to live by the law, we're going to have hostility towards God. Because if we're worried about that we say the right things, we're worried that we might be in trouble. So walking by the flesh is trying to keep all of these things straight all of the time and trying to meet the requirements of the law in our physical body that we have, in our mind, we try to do things right all the time. It's a life of death. Verse 7. Because the heart of mind is enmity against God. Hostility. There it is. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh are not pleased God. You know, we go and ask the world to help us with our problems still yet and every now and then. Not like we used to. But sometimes we do. But you know the law is good, right? So why do we spend so much time contrasting the law and this, this new covenant? The law is good. But the law was never meant to guide us into acceptance of God. The law was meant to guide us into the realization that we can't meet those requirements on our own. The law was meant to serve as a guide for us, to show us that we needed to save. It was given so that we would, would show us our weaknesses and turn us to Jesus Christ. So now you and I live by the Spirit, right? The flesh shows up every now and then. Sometimes we still have some problems with asking the world to meet our needs. And sometimes that's just kind of a, a reaction. Sometimes that's kind of, it's a mistake. And we know that it is, but sometimes it, it just happens. You know, whenever trauma comes around, a bad situation happens, sometimes we use the flesh as a coping mechanism to deal with some of the stuff that we're, that we're going through. But it doesn't take the believer long to, to realize. The Spirit comes to remind you. It doesn't take the believer long to realize, hey, this is not, this is not working for you anymore. It might have been how you used to do things. But that doesn't jive with the Spirit of Christ that lives within you anymore. It'll make you sick. And you're not going to be right until you get that, that right way of thinking lined out. And you're looking, hey, this is, letting this flesh lead in this, this is not working. This is not for me. So we live by the Spirit. We get our needs met by that. We get the right people, all those things. We talk about that. We get love, we get acceptance, we get purpose, we get identity. All of this comes into the new covenant. You understand that, right? Every bit of that is just given to you. Openly and free. So whenever we are full and we have all of our needs met, you see, you can go out back in, out into the world. And instead of asking the world to meet your needs, what you have now is being full of the Spirit. Now you can go out into the world to give some of those needs to people around you. This is God's whole plan right here. 
It's one big, beautiful circle. Whenever you are full and you understand that every single one of your needs are being met, that may not be met in the way that your flesh maybe defined it to be, but whenever you know that these needs are being met, you go back out into the world and now that you can have acts of service and freely, not worried about if anybody seen you do it, not worried about keeping score. You understand that I used to think that I would please God by how many people I personally serve. I thought that would make it happen. And my way of thinking was just backwards. And so you can go out into the world and you can help people find acceptance. You can help people be at peace with our Creator. You can show people unconditional love. You can show people all of these things that human beings were created to need. You can do that. And by doing that, you are fulfilling a purpose that God has put you here for. By showing people this new covenant that we live in. And once they're seeing that they're getting their needs met, they need to understand where it's coming from. It's not coming from you just being a good person. It's coming from the fact that you've been filled by the Spirit. Now the Spirit is in control. The flesh is not in control anymore. You have a mind centered on Jesus Christ. So our motivation changes. The origin of where we give or what we go out into the world and ask for has changed. Whenever we see people getting their needs met through us or through our local church or through other people, other believers in general, doesn't matter what church they go to, but whenever you see other people getting their needs met through believers, it makes you very happy. It makes you very content. See, the Spirit unites. The Spirit is far superior than the flesh. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for the Spirit. We want to thank you, God, that you have brought us out of our flesh and you have put your Spirit in directly into our hearts, directly into our minds, that we have everything that we need now. We've moved away from the flesh, we've moved away from the carnal mind. And we understand that we can uh, we can live just a different life now. We're very thankful that Jesus Christ has untethered us from the requirements of the law. And now we are righteous because Jesus has said we are righteous. We're a brand new creation, holy, sinless, with all of our needs being met. So God, we have nothing left to do but turn our praise to you. Thank you that you are sitting on the throne with grace and love. And we just want to thank you, God, that we are seated with you there because of Jesus and his perfect life. So Lord, we want to thank you for this new covenant that we are getting to live and operate freely in. It is truly liberating. We just thank you for this open, free life that we have to love other people. So we give you praise this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So I didn't practice this song this morning, but God just laid it on my heart to, uh, to sing it. Um, just from what TJ was preaching this morning. Um, you know, people, and even yourself, might try to tell you who and what you are. But only God can tell you who and what you are. So this song is 